Good morning uh, and welcome. Sorry for being a little bit late this morning. Uh, my name is Diana Fox Carney. I'm a strategic advisor with Willis Towers Watson. I'm delighted to be here this morning uh, with three panelists, hopefully four eventually, uh, and one on screen. So we're, we're, we're going to have a good conversation. But we have Dr. Nicola Ranger, who's Deputy Director um, of the UK Centre for Greening Finance and Investment at the University of Oxford. Uh, and then we have Andy McFarlane, who's Head of Climate Change at, at, at AXA XL. And we have Ekeswe Yahin, who's Secretary General of the Insurance Development Forum. And on the line, I believe we have Elsie Addo Awadzi, who's Second Deputy Governor of the Bank of Ghana. So we're delighted to be here. Eventually, Rowan Douglas might slide in. He's Head of the Climate and Resilience Hub at Willis Towers Watson, but he's coming, let's put it that way. So thank you for being here. We're here to discuss resilience and, and how resilience, uh, how you understand resilience, how we should all re understand resilience and how that helps inform the work that we're doing. So I would like, I'm going to start with Nicola this morning and just, Nicola, can you just tell me how you understand resilience, what it means to you? Thank you so much and uh, thank you for the invitation to join this morning. I think, but I think I'll start by saying uh, the climate emergency is already here. So a lot of the discussions here are about how we get to net zero, which is obviously incredibly important, but we also desperately need to uh, address the risk that people already face. And that's what I see as resilience. This is about, for everyone in the world, because everyone in the world is vulnerable to risks, and obviously those in developing countries and the poorest people are most vulnerable, but this is about people strengthening, uh, re reducing their vulnerabilities to climate and weather-related risks. And I think as well in, in the last year, 18 months of COVID, I think it's also shown us that it can't just be about climate. We have to build resilience in a much more systemic way. You know, in, in the year, 18 months running up to where we are now, the world has faced not just a climate emergency, but a climate health, economic, financial emergency. Um, and many people around the world still con continue to do so. So I think that we're, when we're now thinking about resilience in 2021 and, and onwards, it needs to be about how do we strengthen um, people's ability to cope and recover with shocks in the widest sense. Thank you. Uh, and we'll get into the, the tools and, and, and ways of understanding that help us do that. But Andy, how does that resonate with you, what Nicola has said? Is that the same understanding that AXA has of, of resilience? And how does that factor into the work that you do as an insurer? Thanks, Diana, and uh, a pleasure to be here today as well. So uh, from an insurance and reinsurance perspective, sort of putting that lens on, um, we think about resilience in uh, maybe two sort of ways, a financial resilience uh, and then a physical resilience. And you know, from a financial resilience, it's, it's thinking about our uh, customers, the economy, as we transition to net zero and uh, how we're able to maintain that uh, sort of resilience within the economy. Uh, from an individual perspective, it, it's, it's along that lines of what you were saying about maintaining that sort of vulnerability that uh, populations have, ensuring that they're able to withstand uh, the, 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 the sort of hazards as they're changing and the impacts of a changing climate. And then a physical resilience is uh, is that sort of direct impact, that sort of bricks and mortar. Um, you know, we talk about Build Back Better, I mean, there's Build Better before, right? How we, um, how we include and bring in new technology, new ideas in terms of making the structures that we build uh, more resilient uh, to the impacts of a, ch a changing climate. And, uh, you know, the, touching on the, the value that insurance has uh, in terms of uh, allowing for that resilience, um, we partnered with the, the Cambridge Centre for Risk Studies, uh, writing a report on optimising disaster recovery and talking about um, the, the, the process of disaster recovery and the, the value that insurance brings in that process. Um, and, you know, some interesting stats came out of that around uh, the level of insurance penetration um, and the speed of recovery. Um, so the higher, as you would expect, the higher the insurance penetration the quicker the speed of recovery. Um, and those recoveries we can think about in the context of um, quality and speed, uh, as well as economic and societal recovery. So it's really about um, sort of 
bringing insurance to bear to create those re that resilience uh, in those communities um, through the capacity uh, to inject that capital post-event, as well as the opportunity that we have uh, in terms of influence in the way communities rebuild after an event to make sure that they are uh, in a better position, they are more resilient, they are built in places which are less exposed to these uh, hazards as they change. Thank you. I'm going to go now to Ekeswe because you're also focused on insurance. Perhaps you can describe to the audience, just for, for starters, what, what the IDF does in this space, but then also go on to tell us, in a sense, what more is required. What do you think of when you think of resilience? How much of the heavy lifting can that insurance piece do? Thank you. Thank you so much for the opportunity to be here and to share on uh, the work of the IDF, and it's directly related to what Andy and uh, you know, you know, Nicola had shared in terms of the ability to support people, to, um, people and the economy's recovery when we do experience shocks. Uh, so the IDF is a public-private partnership. It's led by the insurance industry, uh, but also co-chaired with public institutions, specifically the World Bank and the United Nations. And I think it's always bit good to step uh, back a bit, right? What led to the establishment of this institution? I think within the United Nations and many of the institutions that are on the ground dealing with people, we see the impacts of disasters on people. And there was a conversation around how can we expand the role and the relevance of insurance in those contexts where people are dealing with those shocks. Um, and so the IDF's mandate is to really harness that capacity, those skills, those tools that exist within the industry to apply it to what is a very pressing development agenda. I mean, we are all here right now in the middle of the COP26 climate negotiations. And when you speak to negotiators, the question of adaptation is pressing, right? Adaptation is what people experience, right? It is the loss of lives, it is the loss of livelihoods, it is devastation to economies. And there is an urgency to think about how do we strengthen the understanding around the risks that we are faced with as a community, as a society, as an economy, as people, um, and how do we develop solutions? And so the IDF's mandate is really centered on trying to pull that together, to engage with the public sector, to engage in difficult circumstances. In developing countries where we are faced with one to three percent insurance penetration rates, how can this be more relevant? And so to the second part of your, your question, I try to think of this not simply as insurance in that you know, technical term. I think about it as the challenge of what are the protection systems that we need to deal with the kinds of challenges that we face today, but we are inevitably going to encounter given what we are seeing with climate change. And that's a question that straddles both developed and developing countries. It's pressing for developing countries because they're experiencing now, but also for developed countries, when we think about COVID, right, and how our systems floundered, it is a question about protection systems. Thank you. There's, there's so much to talk about in, in what you've said, but I want to turn now, uh, I think we have on, on the line, Madam Awadzi. Is she? She's here? Uh, I am here, Diana. You're here. Okay, you can hear me. Uh, we couldn't see you. Uh, welcome. Uh, we're sorry you're not here with us this morning, but we're delighted to have you on the line. So thank you for being with us. I wanted to talk to you. You're obviously focused on the financial system, and, and, and Nicola, uh, well, all the, everyone has mentioned that, but Nicola pointed out the importance of that. So how important are considerations of resilience to, to central bankers' understanding of risk? Thank you so much, Diana, and um, I'm really um, honored to be here uh, for this very important conversation. Um, I think for central bankers who sort of tend to think of risk traditionally in terms of risks to, to macroeconomic stability or risk to financial stability, uh, we have no doubt um, beginning, we're no doubt beginning to understand, and, and actually this has been going on for quite a few years now, uh, that climate climate change is a real risk uh, to us and that um, helping to build more resilient economies, more resilient societies uh, and nations and systems um, 
would tend to have um, great benefit, not only for the work that we do, but also for the outcomes that we expect. Um, so basically, we're seeing, for example, um, in Ghana or in Africa, uh, we're seeing that climate change is happening very quickly and it's, it's, it's hitting as where it matters most. For example, we're seeing that uh, you know, production, agricultural production cycles are disrupted, uh, rainfall patterns have changed considerably, and farmers and policymakers are not even able to understand what to expect at what time. Uh, we're seeing droughts, we're seeing floods, we're seeing massive displacements of communities around uh, water bodies that are polluted, uh, dry lands and all of that. Uh, this is fast disrupting uh, not only production cycles, but value chains. Um, it's feeding into prices. This is the thing that central banks try to fight. Um, it's feeding into prices. It's feeding um, into export revenues for nations. It's fixing into balance of payments. Um, and, and so the implications are massive. Not only on the economic side, but we're seeing that the displacements and, and the fact that uh, the economic impacts of these as uh, of, of these of this phenomenon is happening the way it is. We're seeing that the social problems that this is creating is enormous uh, for for segments of society that are already vulnerable. Um, and as 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 the previous speaker said, not even um, you know um, usually having access to social safety nets. And so this is a particular problem for central banks, and we're beginning to feed these into our assessment of risks in the outcome and understanding how these would play out. Uh, and, and really, the, the idea is what tools are available for us as we try uh, to measure, to identify, to measure uh, these risks and what impact they could have going forward. Um, we, we also definitely recognize that the absence of social safety nets uh, and financial safety nets and the issue of access, lack of access to finance uh, and the financial exclusion we, we, we seek, we observe uh, for the critical segments of society that can actually be the change agents uh, when it comes to adaptation methodologies uh, is a real headache. Uh, you find that while most developing countries and emerging uh, markets have an access to, uh, to finance problem, for small businesses, micro businesses. Uh, within those segments, you also find that women are much more disadvantaged when it comes to access to finance and their male counterparts. And women tend to uh, operate informal sector businesses, uh, micro and small uh, businesses. That really could help with adaptation. Um, and, and, and then you find that the youth populations in these, in these countries, in Ghana, for example, a recent census uh, report suggests that about 70 percent of our population is 35 years and below um, and these are out of school um, out of college out of whatever it is high school whatever uh, college some of them don't have uh, what it takes to continue uh, with the education they cannot find jobs and the question really is as central bank is how can we also make policy work for creating more uh, inclusion in the financial system so that uh, these vulnerable groups are able to, to equip themselves uh, and, and empowered to be able to help find technologies that are helpful to the whole economy as we transition to a greener economy. Thank you. You have a lot of work to do, obviously, a, a, a wide scope of uh, responsibilities. So we'll come back and discuss some of that later. I'm now delighted that we have our final panelist, Rowan Douglas. Uh, Rowan, you haven't, the cues here, as everyone knows, are difficult. Um, you haven't had the benefit of hearing what everyone else said, but I'm going to put you on the spot. So you have the word resilience in, in your title. You're head of the Climate and Resilience Hub. Can you just give us your understanding of what resilience means and why it's important to the work of Willis Towers Watson? Sure. Thanks so much, Diana. And it's, uh, it's great to be here. Uh, we've all been quite resilient here in Glasgow to actually make it uh, into, the, uh, into the conference center. So that's one meaning of resilience, that we're still standing or sitting here on the queue. Great to see you, Ekesway, and everyone at Max and Nicola. Um, uh, I, I'm tempted to say um, the thing about resilience is uh, you know it when you see it. Um, but uh, th there is a more, um, I think there's a more clearer sort of definition, as for, at least as far as I'm concerned. And that is, resilience is about 
protecting the coherence of what you value. And um, I say that because resilience is, a, is by its nature an adaptable thing. So let's put it to a really basic uh, example. I want to have a resilient home because I'm concerned about tropical cyclones. And that resilience can come in three, three or four ways. It can be that I make sure my home is not going to be uh, damaged uh, if a storm comes through. So the resilience of, of solidity. You then want to have the resilience of a, of a home that if it is going to be damaged, uh, it's damaged in a way that can easily be repaired and that you have the ability to bounce back perhaps through financial uh, 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 financial support as well. So resilience, that famous phrase, to, to bounce back as, as to well as completely withstand something and not be moved. But in a broader way, we, we all know that actually true resilience is about being able to adapt to changing circumstances. And there comes to a point that actually uh, bouncing back isn't enough, and that's, that's not even sustainable either and we need to think about a more uh, a more structural change in this case it might be uh, uh, defending the property in a more secure way or, or even moving so when you really pair it back what is what is resilience in that sense it's about protecting the coherence of shelter protecting the coherence of the person or the family unit and their and their living security and and I think that's uh, what it means uh, to me and to our team at Willis Towers Watson and Willis Towers Watson more generally, the, the, the absolute key thing with resilience is actually to identify the absolute essence of what it is you value and what it is you're trying to protect. And over what time scale are you looking to protect that thing? You could be happy to protect something for just one year and then, and then it doesn't matter anymore. Or it could actually be... Uh, looking ahead over your lifetime, that's a you know, multi-decade. It could be the integrity of a set of values which you believe in, which actually, in your view, are permanent. Mm -hmm. So um, as we look in the context of, obviously, a changing climate, but everything else that has to change as we respond to that changing climate, the heart of resilience is to say, what is it that we truly value? And I assume it's going to be, at the very essence, human dignity and what is, the, uh, what is the support that human dignity needs to have to, uh, to, to succeed for all of us in these changing circumstances. So for me, that's what resilience is really all about. Thank you. Um, that was an extremely eloquent uh, stage setter for this conversation. And I think the way you've described resilience as something which is based on values and is about coherence. So it's not about sort of isolated bits and pieces. It's about the whole and it's about bouncing back while your baseline is also moving. And I think that's, that's critical in the climate space is we know that lives are shifting. We know that our economies are transforming. So we have to be able to accommodate that and the crises that are going to come all the time. And I want to turn to Nicola now because you, you started off with this notion of complex uh, risk and systemic resilience and perhaps reflecting on the way Rowan's described his understanding of resilience. You can talk us to, to, to us a little bit how you think that we need to accommodate all these different pieces and bring them to bear in our work. Thank you. I I think, as I mentioned before, I think one of the key things that we've learned in particular over the last 18 months or has been put right in our faces is that we're all interconnected. And at, and at every level, be it the householder level, individuals, economies, the financial system, infrastructure systems, supply chains, everything is interconnected. And this means that when we think about resilience, we need to think about resilience at these different levels. So the household resilience, families, but then a whole economies. We heard about work in the central bank in Ghana about a resilient financial system, which is absolutely critical as well in terms of making sure people can access the finance that they need in emergencies so that they can rebuild. And all these things have to come together um, to, to make us resilient. And that's what we, I mean by systemic resilience. 
And that's really hard to do, <laughs> as, as we've seen uh, in the last uh, uh, 18 months. But I think it's one of the step changes that we're making now in understanding resilience is, is understanding those interconnections and that actually we, if we want to build resilience, then we, we need to understand those interconnections. We just put out some research uh, a couple of uh, weeks ago now, for example, that showed that if you look at, and, and this is a, a, one of the points that I'm, I'm stressing at the moment, climate change doesn't happen in isolation. It happens at the same time that financial shocks happen, economic recessions happen, a whole range of issues happen, floods on the way to Glasgow happen, and all of these things happen. And when they happen together, which they tend to do, the, the size of them is amplified. And we did some research showing it can be 150% or more amplified. And so if we're just thinking about shocks in isolation and not thinking about all of these interconnections, then we won't be resilient. So, so that's, a, that's a, I think, a key shift that we need to be making now in our understanding of resilience. And one of the things that I knew a lot of us have been working on is this means that we need to be integrating resilience into our thinking at a whole range of levels of society. And we need a shared understanding of what risk is and what resilience is. And also a shared understanding of what, what risk means to, to me or my organization. Um, because our perception of risk is very different across different organizations. And that can lead us to make decisions that actually impact on the resilience of others. So we need that to be much more transparent and explicit, I think, in the way that we make decisions about resilience and have this shared understanding of risk. And just to continue on that, do we have, how do we develop the metrics that help us understand that and help us understand not just the, as you described, the individual risks, but the interplay of those risks? Because obviously that's an area you, you're working on. Uh, um, yeah, well, I, I think one of the key things to say is that our, that understanding of risk has a lot of gaps in it at the moment, um, particularly in emerging and developing economies, but actually even in the developed world as well. Our, our understanding of risk tends to be inconsistent, tends to be incomplete, tends to be unavailable um, unless you're, you're very rich and you can buy the, the best catastrophe risk model from, from a, a catastrophe risk modeling company. Uh, so there's a, there's a need to not just improve our understanding of risk, but allow people to access that understanding as well much more readily. And I know, you know many of us work on this agenda and is really important for us all. Uh, we, we um, over the next couple of days, will be launching a new initiative, which is about trying to make information more available. But I think one of the key things is that we, we all have a different individual part of the picture and we need to work together to bring that together. I don't think any one person has the solution. It's about coming together um, experts in flood, experts in financial crises, experts in uh, vulnerability in developing countries, food insecurity. We need to bring that knowledge together and build a really strong integrated view of risk and make that information available. So, um, specifically on the systemic risk side, so there's a huge amount of innovation in that area at the moment. So at the University of Oxford, for example, we do a lot of research looking at uh, infrastructure systems resilience and food systems resilience, trying to understand how shocks um, move across different systems and actually impact on people on the ground. And I think that's, that's for us, that's sort of the next frontier. And that's a, an, information, an information that we'll be hoping becomes much more readily available in the next year or so. Yeah, it's, it, it feels, listening to what you say, it feels like an almost infinite kind of work agenda that we have going forward to, you know, you've got mini systems, as it were, and then putting those, you know, piling those systems together and understanding the whole. Andy, I want to turn to you because I know that at AXA you've developed a coastal resilience index. Can you describe to us how that works and how that informs your, your activities? Yeah, sure. Uh, thanks. Um, so the, the coastal risk index, we sort of take, it, take a few steps back. Um, in 2018, there was the Ocean Risk Summit, uh, which was held in Bermuda, uh, really to highlight the, the importance of the blue economy um, globally and the stresses that the oceans were under um, from the impacts of that economy, but as well as from a, a changing climate. And coming out of that, uh, we started some work on the Coastal Risk Index, which was really the aim of that is to develop a tool to allow us to accurately value uh, the impacts uh, that the coastal uh, ecosystems have. 
Um, that tool is going to be launched later in the uh, later in the week um, at COP. And it's you you talk about trying to think about all aspects uh, of the risk that we're facing. Uh, the the initial uh, launch of that model looks at uh, focused on the physical risk side, looking at the impacts of uh, wave heights, uh, storm surge, uh, under changing changing climate at different time periods, at different extremes. Um, looking out to 2030, 2050, um, under the the most severe RCP scenarios. So the aim to to sort of get it get an idea and an impact on the physical risk side, but work will continue to look at the social and the economic the vulnerability piece. Um, looking at, you know, what that means for coastal communities, uh, what impact uh, the, those sort of uh, physical risk might have on the livelihoods, um, the physical risk, the the, the security piece um, of those coastal communities. So, you know, th the the initial release covers that one aspect, but we are looking to sort of further develop it, and the value that brings is um, is is broad uh, from an insurance perspective. It allows us to look at those risks and understand um, the potential impacts that we will see um, through changing sea levels at different uh, different time horizons. From an investor's perspective, it allows us to uh, it allows investors to get um, a sense of the impact that that's going to have over the lifetime of their investment. Uh, governments can use it to understand the communities that are at risk, um, and you know, uh, World Bank. Uh, um, development banks can use it to understand where appropriate infrastructure and development um, is needed. So, you know, I, as you said, it, it's it's as part of a solution, um, but I think the integration of all of those is is uh, is key. Understanding how all of them contribute, um, and you know, maybe thinking broadly, more broadly around tools and system thinking, right? Not thinking about risks in isolation. Um, you know that uh, I think you you touched on the compound events um, and the impact that um, multiple events have uh, on communities. I think we need to we we definitely need to move our mindset in that direction. Rowan, you work with and oversee a variety of these tools and analytical approaches. Perhaps you could describe start by describing what kind of data is being aggregated? At what level of granularity are we really trying to think about information to make it helpful for work? And, and just how these different analyses fit together to give us a more sophisticated and actionable understanding of resilience, because that's what it, sure. it's about. It's not just sort of intellectually yeah. understanding it. Yeah, and I'm, I'm gonna focus on, on physical resilience, you know, related to sort of climate and other, uh, and na other natural uh, or <laughs> anthroponic disasters. But, um, but actually these same principles can apply to, to, to many other areas. And the, the exciting thing about having landed uh, as working in a reinsurer is you realize that all these different risks we face, economic, physical, uh, environmental, all sorts, actually can be integrated into a common, a common frankly, metric and language, because ultimately, a reinsurer has got to hold capital to deal with anything that happens, interest rate fluctuations, natural disasters. So actually they've had to create a unifying, a unifying system for translating physics into capital or translating uh, human sentiment in markets into capital. So, uh, and in a way we're going to try and take reinsurance in a box and, and make it like out there. And in the end it's, it's a marriage of three disciplines. So first of all, it's a marriage of human and physical geography. So everything, everything I'm about to talk about, if you, if you study geography, basically all we're talking about is a glorified atlas. This is about reinventing geography and geography taking over from economics. So the first discipline is geography, understanding how the world works as a system. That's what geography is. The next um, uh, discipline is engineering. Denise, I say it not just because one of Britain's, if not the world's greatest engineers, is in the back row. Engineering, not because that represents the built environment, but because of the metrics and methodologies in engineers have had to pioneer to allow structures to be stable. 
So my backwater of finance, reinsurance, was revolutionized in the early 90s when engineering methods and metrics were applied through this area called catastrophe risk modeling into understanding the impacts of hurricanes on the built environment. But we suddenly realized that uh, stress tests, return uh, periods, exceedance probability curves, all the things you learn in 101 engineering back in university were actually the magic code that we needed to apply exactly the same structural tests to financial portfolios and specifically in the area of natural disasters. The third discipline, and I'm now I bring my own CEO into the equation, John Haley, the third discipline is actuarial science. Because actuarial science allows us to understand and simulate distributions of, of events and worlds that have never happened. So our bench is to simulate, when we stress test uh, uh, a, a, a reinsurance portfolio uh, for its uh, exposure to US hurricane, just the standard approach is to simulate 10,000 potential years, not into the future, not into the past, but 10,000 years of current atmospheric and physical conditions. We, we train those models and then we use uh, simulations to essentially expand what is uh, a useless historical data set into something that actually allows you to understand what could happen once every 100 years because you've, you've simulated 10,000 years of potential uh, potential uh, events. Now one can argue about whether that simulation is accurate or not, but that's where the endless recycling of, of, of testing against what really happened in the models, and it's not just some vague thing, it's simulating real hurricanes with real wind fields, with real tracks, with real, I mean this is, this is, this is like, this is like Atlas in a box. So this is the, this is the beauty. It sounds so complicated bringing together all these different risks. It's not. It's simply saying, we're going to take the precious origination of geography and the atlas that you went to school with, we're going to turbocharge it by turning it into a model, not of a, not of a, of a globe that is just static, of a literally representation of the system as it is, with the help of some climate models. We represent the built environment and all other uh, all other, all, all other human systems that sit on top of that, including agriculture, and then we have to magically run 10,000 years of that world to give us a sense of where the risk is. Which populations are at risk if a temperature over here starts to fluctuate in this zone and it corresponds with uh, something to do with the vulnerability of that community or that asset? And so that's the final element. What is the secret source that in the end gives you the right or the wrong result? First of all, it isn't being able to model the climate right. That's kind of the easy bit. Of course, we have variation in where the climate is, but broadly speaking, we know which way it's going. Uh, there's lots of data. Uh, you can argue this, that way, or the, 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 the hazard is always the easy bit, but, every, but everyone always makes a big fuss about that. The second most difficult thing is actually uh, understanding the details of, for example, the built environment. There's nowhere you can go and get actually a proper, it's ironic, we, we didn't create nature but we understand it, we built the built environment. If I want to get a built environment, uh, if you like, map of the UK, which says what are those structures, what are they made of, how old are they, can't get it. So the biggest challenge usually, or you go to a bank and you say, what, 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 is, what are the properties in your mortgage portfolio? And all they have is maybe a, a, they might have an address if you're lucky, but they probably don't. So you have nothing to actually stress test against. But then the really magic thing is the vulnerability function, is what exact wind speed gust affects that type of wheat crop as opposed to that type of wheat crop. And it's literally the nitty gritty of what stress threshold, in Denise's language, breaks or um, impedes an asset. Asset could be a human being, it could be a crop, it could be whatever. And it's the vulnerability functions, fragility functions, we're gonna call them resilience functions, it sounds more positive. Um, so, but it's that, it's that simple recipe. The recipe and the gearbox 
is for us now relatively simple. The challenge is bringing it together and then critically creating it so that the wider world can A, understand it, have some shared metrics which allow us to share whatever the miles an hour are or kilometers an hour unit we need for risk, but then to actually consume it inside our own markets. And for us, the focus are the two markets that drive human behavior. One is the relationship to capital and value, because that moves markets, as we'll hear from John's speech on Wednesday. And the, third, the second is law and legal duties. If, if what we're saying about climate is foreseeable, and in some sense is forecastable, then those who have a duty of care to others can no longer say, we did not know it was going to happen. So the beauty of this modeling world, and to take on risk, which means to dare, to dare the gods, that you have some view about what will happen in the future, is that it actually allows legal duties of care from human rights to statute to tort law to become tractable. And that means protecting your life, your livelihood, and your shelter. So there you go. Thank you. I'm, um, I, I'm much wiser now, but I'm also uh, extremely grateful that there are people who are doing these things because the way you've described the implications is, is, is very positive. But I want to turn to Ekaswehi now because you work with a lot of governments and, and many of those governments are in poorer, vulnerable countries. How, uh, how much access do they have to the kind of information that Rowan is talking about and how much capability do they have to use that information to increase their own resilience? That's a great question. Um, there is information available in many developing countries, but it's nowhere near enough. Um, and I'll say, I say it's nowhere near enough because building on Rowan's point, right, we can do all this fantastic work in terms of gathering information on hazards, vulnerability, etc. But what's the point of that? That is to inform a conversation with a government of what is acceptable. <laughs> What risk is acceptable for us as a culture? Is it, is it acceptable that, you know, the majority of farmers have no protection, right? And those conversations drive the decisions that we make around the investments, around our financing in many countries, right? Uh, and I say this not only looking at it from government's perspectives, but also the voice that civil society actors can have as it relates to these issues. The voice that academic institutions can have as it relates to these issues. So the question around risk modeling is really critical, right? Because it's a way to bring transparency, to in a way give voice <laughs> to what are the risks that we are facing as a community and what can we do to address that. So within the IDF, and as Nicola and um, Rowan had mentioned, we're doing a tremendous amount and we're focusing on that as a key pillar of our, of our activities within the IDF uh, because we see this as central for those conversations. And it's also central for the insurance industry to be able to add value in those contexts where, again, they are not necessarily as present as they need to be. And so one of the critical things that we are doing this COP is to actually, and I'll take liberty as Secretary General of the IDF, <laughs> say this, is to launch a partnership with the vulnerable group of 20 countries. These are 48 of the most vulnerable countries in the world to climate change on a partnership on risk and resilience analytics. And for those countries, this is really important. This is at the heart of how do they deepen their capacity to understand risk, the tools available to them, but how can they use that to also strengthen the negotiations that they have with other international partners and also with the markets in terms of driving finance for adaptation and whatever else. So for me, I like to think about, yes, we can think about the whole risk and resilience question in very technical terms, but ultimately it is to drive that conversation about what is acceptable for us as a society and opening up that conversation to communities beyond just the silos that, that currently uh, kind of hold, hold on to that. So I hope that you know, uh, through the work that we are doing with Nicola uh, across the industry with our public sector partners, we can actually drive real transformation because it is, it is urgent and it's necessary and it's essentially the pillar uh, for us to start uh, doing, I think, positive things. 
It does seem that societies in general are ripe for a change in dialogue uh, around risk. And I mean, I've been struck that in COVID, countries have a very different attitude to risk, but we also haven't, it, it seems to me, been used that as a way to get into conversations with publics about risk and how governments are treating risk and what the data is and why they're making decisions, what kind of risk levels they're tolerating, etc. That I mean, that's just how I felt about it. You, you guys may disagree, but just quickly before I go back to Madame Abwazi, I just wanted to ask you whether there's any danger for those countries. The more explicit the risks become, does that mean they have less access to financial products, for example, and other things? So is there any, is there any sort of dark underbelly of this? I've heard those concerns voiced, um, and it is, it is a concern that is emerging in some corners. But I think that part of the challenge that we're faced with is we cannot hide. <laughs> Right? We cannot actually afford to hide the risks that we, are, we, we have to contend with and the systemic nature of those risks. It's got, that is counter to what it is that we actually need to do. So I think that, again, to the point of what are the kinds of conversations that we're having with governments around this topic, right? How, is it, uh, how are we encouraging them to use this information to empower them, to empower their populations? And I think that we are getting there. Uh, the partnership that I mentioned with the V20 is central to that, right? Uh, and again, it's an unusual partnership because you have the insurance community, the public sector, working with countries that, you know, they, historically, it's not, <laughs> we, we, did, we couldn't have these conversations. And for me, this is, this is part, you know, it is part of, to the point that you made. I think people in many countries out of COVID, there is an increased awareness of risk. There is an opportunity there for us to engage. And these conversations that we are having around risk models and information, is a way in which we can do that and make that tangible uh, for them. So uh, I, I think, yes, there is that risk you mentioned, uh, but I think that the benefits far outweigh, outweigh, that, outweigh that narrative. That's good. Uh, Mrs. Awadzi, hopefully you, you can hear me still. I just wanted to come back to you and talk a little bit about the financial system again. We've seen a, 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 an explosion of disclosure uh, in the financial system. We had the uh, Task Force for Climate-Related Financial Disclosure. Now we have the Task Force for Nature-Related Financial Disclosure. Um, and there's all manner of other metrics that are being, uh, well, hopefully regularized a little, little bit, even as we speak. But uh, do you feel that in your jurisdiction, you know, are you using those systems? And, and do you feel that you have the information available to you to make good uh, resilience-based decisions? Thank you, Diana. Um, so I would say somewhat. Um, there is there is quite a, a good understanding of all the work that's been done around the world, uh, in particular in relation to frameworks for uh, disclosures, for reporting, for risk, uh, climate risk assessments and, and quantification, all of that. Um, Many central banks in Africa are aware of what is going on. Um, I must say that um, there's still a lot of room for improvement in terms of accessibility, um, you know, uh, of those info of, of these frameworks and uh, and approaches and, uh, and and tools and all of that. But there is awareness. Uh, that awareness needs to grow and needs to be made more tangible and translated into real action. Uh, but let me step back a little bit uh, to the, you know, the governance around these international efforts. Uh, it just seems to me that we're still back on the same track where the international financial system um, is heavily represented by advanced economies. They are the table making the rules, uh, you know, developing the frameworks, developing countries, emerging markets do not sit at the table. Uh, we often um, are playing catch up and trying to understand what, what is going on. Um, let me add that some, some, some of the international bodies are doing very well in terms of somehow creating room for uh, voices from the developing countries and emerging markets to be heard. So the Financial Stability Board, for example, uh, you know, has this, these regional consultative groups. Uh, there's one for Sub-Saharan Africa, for example, 
if you took the whole of sub-Saharan Africa, um, it's only South Africa that sits uh, that has a seat has a seat on the Financial Stability Board or the BIS. Uh, so the rest of us uh, are able to to have conversations with the FSB from time to time through what they call the Regional Consultative Group. Um, and it's often a time when uh, the FSB is sharing with us the work that they're doing. We get a chance to comment. Uh, we don't have a vote at the table. Uh, and there's a sense in which the real needs um, that we face are not always translated into the rules because the rules are made for developed economies um, and advanced economies. So it, it's really important that we understand that. Um, this brings me to the point about how um, how our countries ourselves are dealing with these matters. And, and, and the point that Rowan or someone, the other, um, I think uh, Rowan made earlier on about shared understanding of risk. And I think it's extremely important how our countries ourselves are positioning uh, ourselves to understand better uh, the risks that we face uh, and how they may or, not be, or may not be different from how the, the uh, other parts of the world uh, also understand these risks or how these risks are playing out there. Um, what we find, as has been alluded to, is still the silo mentality where you have, uh, in Ghana, for example, and in many parts of Africa, you have the government ministries that are dealing with climate strategies and developing the NCDs and, and negotiating at COP26 uh, and coming out with major policies to deal with mitigation, adaptation, all of that are probably not talking with insurance regulators or banking regulators um, or the industries that are, you know, uh, are in, that should be involved uh, in these discussions. And so you find a bit of a disconnect, right? Um, and then even when you come to the financial regulatory uh, environment, um, you find that as we saw uh, many years ago before the global financial crisis, you tend to have insurance regulators regulate insurance according to the core principles. You saw banking regulators do the same, um, and so on and so forth. You know the markets, the you know the securities regulators think of their own uh, ideas in terms of risk. The concept of systemic risk only emerged after the global financial um, crisis, um, and the fact that regulators needed to work better together to understand risks that affect. Uh, financial stability across, not so much from uh, one sector or the other, but across board. Um, that that has worked. We've seen that when it comes to financial stability, uh, under the auspices of the Financial Stability Board and the guidance is provided over the years, um, financial regulators have become more aware of the need to work together. And so there's been uh, quite a number of countries that have come up with their financial stability councils or uh, or committees and, and all of that, that have all of these interests uh, around the same table, understanding risks across the financial system. I think a similar effort is needed. And while we can think of financial stability risk and still think of how climate risk is a key driver of risk to financial stability, as is, as is the case, and all of that, I think we need a lot more of a coordinated effort uh, in terms of understanding these common risks and how the climate risk is playing out uh, across the financial system and across economies and bring bringing together the national level um, stronger cooperation arrangements uh, where all the parties um, are present, not only in the public sector, in the private sector, academia, every, everyone else that has anything to, to, to share. And that, and and also the the victims themselves, really the vulnerable groups, that they have a voice, so that they can also impact, uh, you know, policy and regulation, uh, and the design of financial instruments and 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 other interventions. And then uh, I wanted to deal a little bit also with understanding of uh, disaster risk management and the fact that. Um, in addition to even understanding it, also the capacity of countries to deal with this uh, may be impaired, uh, in particular when you talk about developing and emerging markets. Uh, there's also the need for maybe regional arrangements, global arrangements to pool risks together uh, beyond what a single country can do. And there's a good example in Africa and at the species of the African Union where uh, the African risk capacity still in its infant stages, but has capacity to grow. It currently has 
a membership of the 30, of 35 of the 54 uh, African Union countries. Um, this is a system that allows them all to pool their resource, some resources together um, so that they can come to the aid of countries in the Sahel or other places that are facing uh, disaster or extreme weather conditions uh, with, with losses and all, or etc. Uh, but this is kind of new and there's a need to strengthen these mechanisms uh, while, you know, improving on a common understanding of what we face as a people. Thank you. Thank you. I, that leads um, nicely into my next question. We, we end up talking about pooling risks, sharing risks, helping each other out. And that's what insurance is about. Uh, but there's a lot of, as, as you pointed out already, in, in many of the most vulnerable countries, there isn't much insurance. I mean, we, we, we rely on insurance, but it's not there. So that particular mechanism, Andy, how, do you, how does your company think about extending the scope of insurance and bringing people in so that they can, as you described, recover better and be more secure in their general livelihoods? So we work uh, very closely with Ecosway and the IDF. Um, we're, we're involved on a number of the work streams there uh, in terms of helping to progress that. Um, we bring capacity to the market to, to governments um, and risk pools which uh, already exist. I mean, I, um, we heard about the, the African risk capacity there. Uh, I think another uh, great example is the Caribbean um, Catastrophe Risk Insurance Facility, which initially started off with just a handful of islands, um, but has uh, covering a, a couple of the hazards around wind and, and quake, um, but has grown <clears throat> to include a number of the islands now covering a wide variety of perils. So I think there, there was the, the, the demonstration of the value that um, insurance can bring, structures that are in place uh, to allow that risk um, to be to be passed over from governments to the private sector, as well as the structure that it took. Um, you know, sometimes I think we think about the need to provide insurance to uh, households or, or, or people, but those, uh, those mechanisms actually provide the funds to the governments, which then allow the funds to be distributed to the, to the people in need quickest. Um, so, you know, it doesn't necessarily, the design of the product doesn't necessarily have to be at that sort of granular level to, to get those funds and finances to, to the right places. And then I think there's, uh, you know, work we do on, on the research side. Um, the, the, the report I, uh, I touched on earlier highlighting that value, trying to demonstrate that value to government so that they can see the importance um, that insurance and finance has in managing some of those risks that, um, they can, you know, they shouldn't be taken. Uh, you know, I think COVID, as, as, we, as we've seen, the impact that that's had on governments, um, and as Ekwesue said, I think it, it's making uh, governments realize that they, they can't manage all these risks, so we have an opportunity there. Um, but they need to see what that value looks like. Um, they need to see structures that work. Um, and then, you know, research also thinking about sort of compound events, um, understanding that it's not necessarily just a climate event which might trigger a loss. It might be um, a societal event. It might be, um, you know, a, a conflict as well as a drought. And how we start to think about bringing all those pieces together to bear on being able to transfer risk and, to, and sort of take it on. Um, there's, there's no point in designing a, a product that responds um, to a climatological event uh, only when it's a, a, a compound event which causes um, a loss and, and those communities to be impacted. Uh, so, you know, a, a variety of ways uh, we're, we're looking to be involved. Um, also thinking about nature, you know, we, we haven't touched on that too much yet. Uh, Nature-based solutions, the importance of um, mangroves, coastal marshes, coral reefs, um, trying to value those and assess those, uh, bring those into the equation as an, as an understanding and a mechanism for governments to use, not only to provide resilience to communities, um, but a, they are a, a big sequester of carbon um, and mangroves and, and, and other um, natural assets have obviously been removed and um, eroded over time. So how do we think about 
and how do we bring uh, more capacity and more insight uh, to allow governments to see that and, and those type of solutions to be developed. Thank you. I think that actually you've brought us nicely to your video segment. I have more questions uh, and I'd love to encourage anyone who's in the audience or online to, to share any of their questions. But I think Andy's um, teed us up well for our video segment which talks about, you know, to a good extent, about, about nature and how we can protect nature and how nature helps protect us. So if we could um, have that now, that would be great. Los huracanes en el arrecife pueden llegar a ser muy graves de destrucción física de toda la barrera, la destrucción del tejido vivo y asimismo la matriz que lleva millones de años de haber sido construida y se requiere un gran esfuerzo para poder reconstruirlo. Los beneficios que nos dan el seguro paramétrico para el arrecife son indispensables. Si hubiese un huracán o algún accidente, requiere la atención en el momento inmediato. Entonces el seguro nos cubre de poder tener esa oportunidad de que los técnicos, los especialistas, las brigadas de rescate, los pescadores, vayan en ese momento, rescaten lo más posible y podamos entonces salvar lo, lo indispensable del arrecife. Como brigadistas en las respuestas a los daños después de un huracán, nos dedicamos a hacer un protocolo de estudio del arrecife de las zonas en las que están más dañadas y de ahí determinamos qué zonas necesitan eh, ayuda más próxima y darle ese apoyo que se necesita. La capacidad de respuesta por tormenta es la capacidad local instalada para poder atender eh, los daños producidos por un huracán o una tormenta sobre el arrecife coralino. Esa capacidad está conformada por un comité, por brigadas de atención, por una red de aliados y por un equipo de operaciones. Desde el 2018 empezamos con esos cursos de brigadas. Tener una capacidad de respuesta temprana permite que el arrecife se recupere de manera más pronta dando beneficios a mediano y largo plazo a las comunidades que dependen de, de esos recursos. This is the time for us to be able to give something back to the reef.
Hablamos desde Medellín, Colombia. Estamos en la esquina de Sudamérica, ahí, en un ladito entre Centroamérica y América del Sur, en toda la esquina. Medellín es una ciudad de 2.375.000 habitantes, de 24 grados centígrados de temperatura y de 1.375 metros sobre el mar como altura básica. Medellín está en un gran bowl formado por unas laderas en las cuales tienen algunas pendientes y allí tenemos en esas laderas de Medellín, en ese gran bowl, tenemos una red de 4 kilómetros de afluentes, de red de quebradas y de afluentes, de riachuelos. Asimismo tenemos un río, el río Medellín, que está por el centro del valle, al cual le llegan más de 4.200 afluentes, pequeños y grandes. Es por eso que tenemos dos temporadas invernales, una en abril-mayo, otra en octubre-noviembre, la que estamos viviendo en esta época, y en las cuales nuestras quebradas, nuestros afluentes, se rebosan bastante teniendo en cuenta el cambio climático y afectan las construcciones, las casas, las bodegas que hay alrededor de las quebradas. Es común construir sobre el lecho de las quebradas en esta ciudad por un abuso de la ciudad, abuso de la población migrante y abuso de ciertas eh, comunidades que ignorando el retiro de 15 metros a, la, a ambos lados de la quebrada, pues construyen encima. Es por eso entonces que en el tema de adaptación y gestión del riesgo de desastres, eh, Medellín es, hace camino hacia el nodo de resiliencia. Y es porque desarrollamos procesos de adaptación física, social y económica frente a los impactos del cambio climático que nos permitan una consolidación de una ciudad resiliente. Por eso formulamos, implementamos que el drenaje urbano tenemos que mejorarlo. Tenemos procesos de monitoreo del riesgo climático y de desastres armonizado con el sistema de alerta temprana en Medellín. Tenemos el gran hermano que se llama el CIATA. Es una disposición tecnológica que tiene cámaras en todas las quebradas de Medellín, en algunas de las vías carreteras y en algunos de los puntos críticos de movimientos en masa, aludios torrenciales y deslizamientos. Además, fortalecemos las instancias sociales en gestión de riesgo de desastres y cambio climático. Ejecutamos medidas de reducción de riesgo de desastres y adaptación al riesgo climático y apuntamos al ámbito social y sectorial. También en las obras de mitigación estamos completamente casados con las soluciones basadas en la naturaleza y obras de bioingeniería para la reducción de riesgo de desastres y la adaptación, obviamente, al riesgo climático y al impacto climático que está golpeando en este momento el país. Eh, eh, hacemos evaluación de riesgos de desastres a través del equipo técnico del DAGRED. El DAGRED es el Departamento Administrativo de Gestión de Riesgos de Desastres. Continuando con el tema anterior, es preciso explicarles que tenemos otro convenio con los cooperantes del Instituto de Resiliencia Alemán, eh, el grupo conformado por el consorcio de Willy Star Watson, el eh, Hanover Re y Global Communities. Un consorcio que muy decididamente está aquí en Medellín, diseñando los parámetros para sacar los términos de referencia a licitar el año entrante en mayo del 2022 a fin de que haya cobertura para inundación, terremoto, de ahí los seguros paramétricos y seguro indemnizatorio para movimientos en masa. Es un convenio internacional también con el Ministerio Alemán, en el cual creemos que Medellín va a ser una ciudad líder, va a ser nodo de resiliencia y va a ser innovadora y creativa en este seguro de ciudades. Así que es un placer estar aquí con ustedes en este panel y agradecer la cooperación internacional que tenemos con este consorcio que en buena hora ha llegado a Medellín. Saludos. Every year there are forest fires here and when you look to the horizon and you see how far away is that column of smoke, how big is that column of smoke, is my to-go bag packed, are, what are my dogs doing, do I have my crates, I mean is the road clear enough for a fire truck to come up, all these things go through your head, you know, and, and it becomes more than just a checklist, you know, it becomes are we going to make it through this year.
The impacts that a catastrophic wildfire can have to a community and an ecosystem are virtually unimaginable to those who haven't experienced them firsthand. It has the opportunity to devastate and to wreck a place that we hold dear, that we treasure, that we call home and have for generations in a way that's irrecoverable. The fires are just getting significantly worse. You know, a big fire when I first joined the Forest Service was 10 or 20,000 acres. Now a big fire is a quarter million acres or more. A bad fire, you know, 10 or 15 years ago might have gotten a few people's houses. Now it's wiping out entire communities. It's just absolutely uh, terrifying to think of the devastation that happens almost instantly. You've got rivers, you've got lakes, you've got forest, you've got open terrain, granite cliff tops. We're in the Sierra Nevada mountains. How much more beautiful can that get? So when you think of a national forest, people think of trees, and that's a major part of what we are. The other thing a national forest is, is water. The rain that falls, the snow that melts, it all passes down through our forests and into our rivers. And that's actually a water supply, not only for people here in these rural communities, but actually for millions of people throughout the state. So if we don't protect our forests and our resources at the headwaters, it's going to have huge impacts downstream. To the average person, they would not see a change in the next 10 years. To a professional coming through, they would say, look at the clearing on the edge of the forest. If there's a fire that starts on the edge of the road, it's not likely to get into the forest before somebody can deal with it. If they're walking in the woods, they'll say, this looks a little different. There's wildlife openings where there weren't any. It'll be invisible to the average person and invaluable to anybody that uses this resource. Managing our forests, furthering these efforts is not something that can wait, it's something that has to happen now. You know, our beautiful backyard can go up in a minute, you know, as it has in many places in California. It is all of us working together that's going to help us, you know, get through this. That was a great film uh, for context. And again, I'm eternally grateful for the people who know how to restore coral reefs and do ecological forestry. But one of the points that was raised in that, particularly in the Medellin sector, was, was the issue of human vulnerability. People are making decisions which are not necessarily the right decisions, but they, 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 have, to, they have to settle close to rivers because that's all the only options they have. Uh, and we've had a question in from an audience member about how one incorporates measures of human vulnerability into these bigger pictures around physical risk and engineering risk and other things. So I, I, I don't know who, who would like to start with that one, who, who would like to raise their hand. Rowan, you're, look, you're, you're looking twitchy, I think you. Well, yeah, it's, it's, it's a great question. And, and thanks so much to the, uh, to, to, to the uh, online community for, for uh, asking it because it, it really cuts to the heart of what we mean when we say when we say risk pools uh, and actually insurance because um, if we're going to make these pools sustainable we have to make sure that um, uh, communities are, are going to be able to uh, afford and, and and be members of those pools but also have um, have an environment which is a, a, of low enough risk to be a member. And what I mean by that is insurance isn't just about uh, a product. Insurance is often about 
uh, public insurance and welfare and we have flood insurance in the UK but only because uh, the government agrees to build enough flood defences. So this really comes to the bigger public policy question that was uh, which was brought up earlier which is what is a as, as a society or in this case in a in a city in Colombia that the leadership of the of the civil authorities in Colombia in this Medellin project has been absolutely remarkable and they're looking at uh, these cities as um, as as communities that need to be resilient in, in a range of ways the exciting thing is what this project that we did uh, sort of uh, enabled us to do was have a shared understanding of the risk to get to a point where we knew what sort of level of risk would be insurable and what sort of interventions uh, the city would need to make to make certain communities less vulnerable and the lovely thing about this shared language and these shared metrics that we're now beginning to use across planning across uh, disaster reduction and even insurances, it allows um, a conversation with the mayor of a city to say, you have a community with different attributes. You tend to have perhaps the poorer, level, poorer people living over here in the perhaps the lower lying area in these sorts of homes. You've got other communities elsewhere. These, the communities elsewhere may be able to support themselves they may need education about the sort of things they need to do to their homes and they may need uh, less help with insurance, but they can probably support themselves. Whereas the people in the poorer community, that's where your, that's where your available dollars may be required to uh, bring that uh, area up to a level of resilience. Maybe there needs to be some work done on, on, on drainage or what have you. And that may be the community through a public-private mechanism that should have some sort of subsidy or support to be members of a risk pool that so when disaster strikes, uh, they will be made resilient, whatever that means. It may mean that they're given cash to maintain their livelihood. It may mean that they're given uh, 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 money to support the rebuilding of homes. So um, it's a great question because ultimately, um, when we say insurance, we're talking about something potentially much broader. And it's all the support that people need uh, to have that security. Uh, that's that sense of security every day and that, re and that real support, predictable support, not begging bowl support, predictable support when something happens. Thank you, Ron. Uh, Mrs. Awadzi, uh, I hope you're still there. I know you've got a, a, a sharp cut off, but we had a question in about whether there was sufficient incorporation of resilience metrics into uh, our understanding of public debt. Obviously, not quite monetary policy, but uh, do you have any thoughts on that? That's a tricky one. <laughs> That's a tricky one uh, because I could take that. Yeah, I could take that from different angles. Yeah. Uh, basically, I'm not sure where the question comes from. Is it about what government is uh, on finance, for example? Is it about how government is using uh, a in instrument and it's borrowing to promote uh, more resilience, i.e., the issue of the framework um, and using proceeds of those to finance application? Methodologies and all of that. So, is that is that the issue, or to, for example, you issue more sustainable uh, sustainability bonds, SDG related bonds, and use the proceeds um, to strengthen uh, safety nets? You know that that would support the vulnerable uh, to make some better choices uh, towards the outcomes that we expect. Um, is it about recent conversations about um, debt relief for governments that are, are able to sort of use what they would have used in debt servicing um, to promote more resilience? So it's a bit um, broad. It's uh, I see it as multifaceted. And um, 
Uh, I'll just say that many governments are thinking of green bonds. We've had a few in Africa. Ghana was hoping to go to the market, the European market, to issue a green bond um, this quarter that has uh, postponed that idea for some time later in 2022. That would be uh, the first time we do a green bond. Um, so I'm not really sure what the question I had in mind, but I do hope that some of the ideas I've shared uh, may, may sort of provide, you know, some, some insights into what, um, what could be the conversation around government debt and resilience. Thank you. Thank you. And thank you so much for being with us today. I, I can see two other people wanting to quickly come on in on that. So we've got Ekesway and Nicola, but I thought those were really two great questions. So yeah. I, I was just reflecting on the fact that when we uh, established the risk pool in Africa, sorry, in Africa, um, the focus was on drought, and it was actually to unpack what does a deficiency in water mean in terms of impact on crops that the majority of low-income households who are engaged in agriculture are dependent on. And so you can quantify that. And so you can then come to some conclusion in terms of, okay, if there's a deficiency on water, this is what it will mean in terms of crops. This is what it will mean in terms of affected households. And so when we have conversations with governments around insurance, those are precisely the conversations that we have that try to translate the natural hazard into some Something that's very tangible and finance around this and so we then get into this second question around debt sustainability because it then takes us into the realm of a conversation with the government around the tools and the options that they have available to them in terms of managing uh, their risks so a lot of the conversations that we are now hearing about debt sustainability sustainability particularly in developing countries is also at the heart of how do we diversify the toolkits right to include other kinds of risk transfer and ex ante financing um, risk financing instruments. So I just wanted to comment on that in terms of the role that insurance can play in terms of uh, building an understanding of risk, but also informing the diversification in terms of financing options. Thank you. Nicola? Thank you. I, one thing I wanted to share was that one of my, my proudest moments recently, and this, this may be more a reflection on, on how strange I am rather than anything else, was in July the UK government for the first time published in its fiscal risk assessment the impact of climate change on public debt in the UK. And this was the first time I've seen a government do this. So it was a forecast and they looked, you know, with and without mitigation and, you know, obviously e even uh, without mitigation, public debt levels go, go through the roof um, and, e and even with um, uh, mitigation a little bit. But I think one of one of the key things I've been working on putting on my practitioner hat over, over the past years is working with ministries of finance to embed risk into core public financial management. And this is critical for a number of reasons. One, because once you recognize the risk, you can manage the risk. And that's where disaster risk financing, as we've just heard, can come in and help in terms of in ensuring there's access to liquidity in emergencies. You don't get that public debt jump when something bad happens. Um, but the other thing is that it's critical to bring risk into public financial management because that, that creates a signal across the economy. So it creates that, it, it um, makes it clear who owns the risk, so th what risk does the government own, what risk doesn't the government own. And once that's clear, then it creates this signal which has a ripple effect when firms um, start realizing, actually, we bear this risk, we need to manage this risk, they can take out insurance, they can reduce risk. But that's absolutely critically important. I think I've been so happy to see, well, in the UK, us making this step, but also the IMF and the World Bank have been really integrating climate risks into their, their work on, on debt management, which I think is an absolutely critical step. Thank you. We could go on, but we're not going to. It's time to end. I just like one sentence from all of you. We're, we're here at COP. There's so much under discussion. A lot is still about mitigation, and there's a lot to do on that front. But adaption and loss and damage are also key topics here. Is there anything that you would really hope for from this broader conversation at COP, not just the, the, the parties, but all of us discussing and, and thinking about how we go forward? What, what might you hope for coming out of this on resilience? You, you may not, I mean, I'm throwing this question out, but if you've got any th quick thoughts. Well, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm a bit weird like Nicola because my, my, I was going to come, come back on Nicola's thing, but my dream is that um, I said, uh, I said we, resilience is uh, protecting the integrity of what we care about, something like that. Well, many people, uh, many people care about their 
their, their credit rating and their access to credit. So uh, my dream for COP is that fi uh, physical climate risk becomes an input to credit risk because people really care about their access to credit. And once, uh, once it is just automatic that climate risk is, is part of a, a credit, uh, a credit uh, assessment of a country, an individual, uh, a mortgage, then, uh, then we will be on the right road. And where better than the home of Adam Smith to make that sort of change. Fantastic. I'm going to think about my home now. Um, Andy? Yeah, I, I, I might just jump in, uh, bringing it back to the, the natural assets piece. Um, you know, I think my hope would be uh, that their awareness around the impacts that natural assets have in multiples away, whether it's from a risk reduction perspective or from a carbon sequestration perspective, uh, become more recognized and uh, we start to think about how we can value those um, in the way that we think about risk. Um, so it's not just an expected loss from an event, but it's, it's what the environmental impact that that uh, event might bring um, to that community or, or a particular um, asset. And then I think um, we're at COP, it's the Congress of the Parties. Uh, we're not going to solve this problem um, as an individual company. Um, this is, you know, Ecosway with the IDF. It's a collaboration, right? We need uh, companies to come together, parties to come together, models, modeling, uh, to be working together um, to solve a problem around things of um, protection under insurance. Um, so, you know, reinforcing that need for collaboration would be a, would be a, a goal for me. Thank you. Echo Sway? Yes, I'll, I'll echo, echo that, Andy. Um, better public-private partnerships, stepping out of the comfort zone, work with those countries that are at the, for, at the forefront of the climate crisis, do difficult things, <laughs> right? Um, that, for me, is the challenge, right? Is that for us as a collective within the insurance industry, go to those communities, right? Be partners with them try to design those solutions because the negotiations and the political processes are, are difficult, but there are other channels for action, right? So do those difficult things, have those difficult conversations, and hopefully that can drive the innovation that we need. So I'm also kind of quite optimistic about alternatives when I think about the future and what we can do within this. Fantastic. And last word to Nicola. Well, for, for me, it's, it's about aligning financial flows with adaptation resilience. It has to be. So it, the first step is to bring in risk, and the insurance industry is brilliant at that. It's about pricing risk. It's in bringing it into credit ratings. It's you know, bringing it into financial decision making. But risk, those metrics capture the risk to your own asset or your own investment at the moment. But we also need to consider what's the impact of my asset or my investment on the risk of society around. And that's what I mean by alignment. So I think we need to move from risk to thinking about how do we actually align financial flows with adaptation resilience goals and have that on the same par as aligning with net zero goals. That would be one thing I'd like to see. Well, I think that's a fantastic way to end and a huge challenge to us all, but one that I think we're making progress on. Uh, I hope we're making progress on. So thanks to everyone who is in the room today. Thanks to everyone who is online. Um, and I hope you go away with an increased understanding of, of why resilience matters, how it can frame our thinking, the tools we need, and the solutions that hopefully we will achieve in the coming years. Thank you.